great skills are learned in bad markets, not good markets. Like there are some realtors and lenders out there who are truly honing their skills right now mm-hmm. and making the best of this circumstance. And they're going to be the ones who are positioned to really succeed when things do shift. <laughs> The management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's it's all click of a button, guys. Wishy-washy answer. Well, hello there, Lab Coat folks. Myself, Sean Curley with the one and only Brian Stevens with National Real Estate Post slash Mortgage Shots. Um, we're going to talk to you about what's going on in the current mortgage market uh, as of right now. And uh, Again, like I always say, go to your app store, download an NREP, National Real Estate Post, your mobile app for your cell phone, electronic device, and you get to watch Brian and his team come out with some really, really good content each and every day. But first things first, we had the president sign a 45-day continuance so the government would not shut down uh, as of 12 o'clock this morning. So we kicked the can another month and a half. Uh, we haven't seen a, a, a shutdown, a government shutdown since 2019, and we were trying to put out some stuff to to folks on what if the government does shut down, what actually in fact happens, because it does hamper our ability to help folks get debt in the form of mortgages. So, Brian, um, I know it's been a hot minute, what, four four years ago, whenever we saw this last time, uh, you know, lo- let alone with like TSA guys and girls not getting paid for checking IDs at the airport. But on the mortgage side, what really happens whenever the mortgage, uh, whenever the uh, government shuts down? Well, what I heard is if we have a shutdown, that it could trigger a recession, which kind of looks inevitable at this point. Yeah. So it would hasten the inevitable. And I think that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. If we're going to have it, my God, could we have gotten this over with last year? So let's hasten the inevitable, because as every professional rate prognosticator out there is telling you, (laughs) um, rates will come down when we have a recession. Brilliant! My God, I can't believe somebody came up with that. Yes. (laughs) Well, let me tell you, if we have a bad economy, rates are going to come down. Yeah, rates are going to come down if we have a recession. A recession is inevitable. A shutdown would get us closer to lower interest rates, which would help out housing. And I say, shut the government down. It's all theater, dude. It is all theater out there for your amusement and for my amusement and to keep us from looking at the reality of the situation, which is everything is foobard right now. Yes. Okay? Now, hold on a second. If you shut the government down, my God, some people who depend on those paychecks aren't going to get paid. Well, take a look at the real estate and lending community and what you've done to us. There's a whole bunch of people in our community who aren't getting paid right now because of your actions. I say F it. You too. <laughs> right? How many realtors and lenders are out there right now aren't getting de- uh, getting deals closed, moving 25% of the United States GDP because we've got, we foobarred this thing so bad? I say screw it. If government employees don't get paid, screw them. <laughs> oh, well, it's going to. The rating agencies are going to downgrade the U.S. dollar and global economy. Well, guess what? You've been downgrading my credit. You've been downgrading a whole bunch of realtors' credit. You've been downgrading a bunch of lenders' credits. I say F it. Let's downgrade everybody's credit because that's what everyone deserves right now. Your actions, which are too reprehensible and difficult for you to deal with on a federal level, seems to be the status quo for real estate and lending. So I say if you're going to shut down lending and real estate, which you've effectively done, shut the whole thing down. Let's get lower interest rates. I thought, okay. we were gonna go, I thought we were going to go a different route. Like, you know, no USDA funding because they're furloughed. Can't get, can't, Shut it down. At this point, like, the, like the whole industry is like such a laughable mess right now. A ridiculous laughable mess, right? Let's take your USDA deals right now. Great. Who's doing those deals? You got, did you, do you know a study just came out that said 99% of people in this country cannot afford the average priced home? What does it matter if we have USDA or not? It doesn't even matter anymore. You can't use it. If I can't afford the uh, the price of the ticket to go in and see Taylor Swift, I don't give a shit what song she's playing. 
<laughs> that's what they've done to our that's what they've done to the housing industry right now. That, well, well, I mean, my God, look at these loan look at these loan level price adjustments with Fannie Mae and Fred. This is unbelievable what they've done. We're gonna make it easy for people with bad credit to go ahead and get mortgages. They can't afford a mortgage. Who cares? Give them a, a hundred thousand basis point improvement with a 620 credit score. They're not buying a house. Nobody's going to do a 620 credit score deal right now on a Fannie Freddie or a Jenny deal where your average credit score is 754. Yeah. So it's all theater, dude. Shut it down, man. Shut the whole thing down. That's what I say. Brian coming in. I know there's beautiful Monday morning. Why not? I mean, like, do you really want more <laughs> of the status quo? Do you want more of the status quo? No, no, but this just reminds me of the meme of like the dumpster on fire and the guy's like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> it, I'm telling you right now, Sarah, every time that we come up against our budget crunch, we do this every time. This is yeah. every time. It's a last minute. Whew, we got the budget like every single time. And do you want to know what type of pork they're throwing into this thing at the last minute? Like the reason we have all this theater is this is when they fund a bunch of crap that makes no sense to anybody. It makes itself into all of these bills, stuff that me and you would find reprehensible on a whole bunch of levels. Yeah. I, I Again, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm sick of this theater. I've watched it for the past 30 years. I don't know what happens when we shut the government down for, for six weeks or two months or three months. I say we shut them down. Let's do it. Yeah, they the, shut down uh, real estate and lending with their actions, with their policies. They've effectively destroyed real estate and lending in this country. So I say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it's an interesting time with next year being an election year. I I, I didn't even look this up to see how many times that uh, we've been in a recession during an election year. Because normally it's the rosy picture that people are painting so they keep their jobs. So it it would be interesting for sure if, uh, you know, if and when this all does come to a head because it will. But let's... hey, I just filled up my truck yeah. uh, with gas. Do you want to know what I paid per gallon? Well, you're in California, and that's a whole different animal. You, you guys are. Do you want to know what I paid? Two hundred and thirty bucks. Well, it was seven bucks a gallon. Oh, let's go one seven bucks a gallon. One sixty-eight. Seven, not six ninety-five. Not it's seven like down. six ninety-nine and nine nine tenths. Yeah. I... That's that's a that's quite expensive. So what was the total cost? Uh I put 140 bucks in and it didn't right. fill it up. So here in Missouri, I uh I think I paid 367 this morning and I was still upset. So I I I sympathize for you out on that beautiful state. But you guys have amazing weather and amazing views, you know. So there you go. <laughs> And all we can do is laugh about it, Brian. All we can do is laugh. Listen, this whole thing is laughable to me. You you know why? Because we've been, for a lot of us, we've been here before. We've talked about this. 2008 was a whole set of different circumstances. Uh, But, but like under understanding how to get through in a market where everybody struggles, like I, I I got that in my DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And, and a lot of people do. And a lot of people will figure out what the rules of engagement are. They're different than in a good market. Uh, great. Great skills are learned in bad markets, not good markets. Like there are some realtors and lenders out there who are truly honing their skills right now mm-hmm. and making the best of this circumstance. And they're going to be the ones who are positioned to really succeed when things do shift. And I, it could be two months. It could be 10 months. I, like I said, let's have this recession. I, I, I'm i ready for it. Yeah. So, you know, when that happens and rates come down, then yeah. Oh, by the way, when rates come down. Okay. So like, let's say rates go down by, I, what, what did Barry say? Well, he, he thinks, well, we're, we're going to get into that. Yeah. So uh, what did he say? You know, what, did, what did he say? What, where are they coming down to? Well, he didn't. They were talking about the 10 year treasury coming from where like 4.7 something down to the mid threes, maybe high twos. So okay. that would equate to the rate should be in, in the fives. OK. All right. Let's five. OK. Let's say they're threes. Ooh. Let's say rates are twos. Okay. Let's say rates are zero. OK. Honestly, one yeah. percent because you guys want you one percent interest rates go down to one percent tomorrow. Woo! We're all happy. Guess what? Nothing changes. Well, no, no, it doesn't change because here's what people will do. People are going to bid the properties up to their maximum qualifying ability. They'll change. The the payments won't change. The interest rates will change. The sales prices will change, but the payments aren't going to change. When you've got a hundred people vying to buy five houses, make the rates 1%, make them 10%. It doesn't matter. We are collectively going to bid that property up to our highest qualifying capabilities, regardless of what that interest rate is. Make it a neg-am deal. It doesn't even matter. Until we start building more houses, 
rates rates aren't the problem. You have 10% rates, 1% rates. The fact remains that we will not move inventory until we have more inventory to move. Yeah, so let, let's recap that. You know, you said Barry. Barry could be with MBS Highway. Him and his team are reporting uh, the next, you know, t- within the next calendar year that um, that the 10-year treasury, which interest rates go up and down with, uh, should be starting to come down to 3.7. Uh, if the recession hits, should go down to mid twos. Whenever rates were in the twos in 2021, it was the 10 year treasury is actually under one. So it's not like we're going to get way back to where it was, but it should help out. But you're 100% correct that, okay, now my affordability comes back. Now there's another million buyers or 2 million buyers into the market that are bidding on homes. What happens to house prices? They go through the roof again, just like they did three years ago. The, so, so they did, by the way, Sean, they did this in Japan in the 1980s yeah. when Tokyo was the most expensive real estate in the world in japan they came out with 100 year mortgages yes 100 year mortgages because nobody could afford anything so they started calling them generational mortgages well that's going to solve the affordability problem it it turns out it didn't solve anything what i said played out just played out they said the only one who 100 year mortgage benefited were the rich who understood how to work the tax code and these generational loans they were they were able to put them into trust and transfer these properties over to their kids without having any type of tax liability or consequence and keeping the loans the same it, it, again it's it's i understand the i understand how people like talk about rates all the time and the importance of rates but we're not we're not our market isn't suffering because of rates i mean the economy is suffering because of rates mm-hmm. because well we should be spending less but we're not we're just yeah. charging more um but it's really not affecting real estate right now. Our real estate, as far as I can see, it's it's this is a this begins and ends with inventory. Yeah. So let's talk about inventory, especially new home, because apparently we're not foreclosing on people and uh, people are living longer. So those are your two really good avenues right. of getting inventory. I hate to say it, but people dying normally the house sells, um, and then uh, you know people get foreclosed on that can't pay. Foreclosures are actually good for the market. Churn over, get people that are paying their damn taxes and cutting their damn yards into these new homes. But we're not doing any of that and people are living longer. So let's talk about builders. You were you were in one of your shows, you're saying like there's only 76,000 completed new builds that are on market. Um, we need like 1.6 million on market to really, you know, see this huge, huge, uh, you know, relief in, into uh, house prices. So why are builders not building at a mass scale? Are they scared that people lost their affordability because interest rates? So no, now they're not selling in those subdivisions, but we still take applications every single day. We we see that there's still a thirst and a demand for home ownership. So why, why aren't the builders building on a larger scale, especially on the lower sides of, of the of the price points? I, I think the answer is actually multifaceted. Um, I think it began with uh, the hangover from the 2008 and 9 meltdown. So what happened in the 2008 and 9 meltdown is everybody was buying second homes, investment homes, property homes, kind of like a lot of what we're seeing right now with the Airbnbs and investors, which have backed off lately. But we we saw that in droves in 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 9 because the loans were available for anybody to buy an investment property. And all that demand spiked uh, property values. And then builders had, uh, it was much easier for builders to build back then. It was cheaper for builders to build back then. There were fewer permits in in place that had to be taken care of. Um, So what they did was builders built to demand in 2005, 6, 7, and 8. Um, They didn't, they built to the demand based on people's capacity to acquire uh, additional mortgages for investment property and second homes, not based on um, new family starts which is a new family going out, a new family formation going out there and saying, Hey, you know, I moved out from my mom. I got married. We got our kids. Mm -hmm. We're buying a house. No, mom and dad were buying two, three houses and kids were buying two or three houses. When those loans kind of bellied up, what happened was, is there was a glut of inventory, a massive, massive glut in inventory and it tanked property values. So the house that was going for 400,000, you couldn't give it away for 125,000 a few years, a couple of years later. So new home builders, they um they got caught with their pants down is really what happened. They had massive inventory. They had massive starts. They had massive new permits. I don't know if you had it out there, but I remember like driving around areas where I live, which is in Northern California, and seeing like the roads put in, you know, how they're getting ready to plumb for a, a new subdivision mm-hmm. and uh, and just watching the weeds growing and weeds growing. And what these builders did is they were taking these properties and they were selling them 
for pennies on the dollar because they're all going broke. So it again, last time we had too much inventory in 2008. Right now we don't have enough inventory. Last time we didn't have enough demand. Right now we have too much demand. Different, different, different triggers, but the same type of problem. Real estate isn't moving. So I think what happened with builders back then is they're saying we can't get caught with a glut of inventory that's going to bankrupt us. So they've been very cautious with their new starts and permits. Keep in mind when a new builder is going to go build a new subdivision, they don't just wake up one morning and build it. After they have decided that that is what they're going to do, I mean, when you look at land acquisitions, when you look at permit, like what does it take to break, break ground? You're a minimum of three, mostly like most likely five years uh, from conception to breaking, just breaking ground. Where's the market going to be in five years? So we have to have projections going forward and new home builders are saying, well, we don't want to do that. I think what has exacerbated the situation is this COVID, which is ridiculous. And, um, and, you know, and the problem with our, our supply lines that we have, you know, uh, framing wood that we get from Canada is, is is more expensive. We know that everyone talks about labor being a problem. That That's probably part of it. They're not building entry level homes because they don't have to. So we're going to try to maximize our profitability on these like zero lot line McMansions that they're once again building because there's just more money to be had in them. And I think that everybody's sitting on so much equity right now. I don't think new home builders want to start to build the small, smart homes like they need to for fear of us losing some of this fake equity that we've gained over the past few years, even though that is the only solution to our national problems or epidemic when it comes to housing right now. So I think it's kind of morphed from uh, we can't do what we did before to, oh, my God, look at all this equity that we built up and we're going to hang our hat on on costs and, and COVID related uh, uh, problems and circumstances. I think it's probably a little bit of both of those. The truth of the matter is, though, is this is becoming an epidemic of global proportions. I mean, global proportions. When you look at what the United States housing market represents to our GDP and what our GDP represents to the global GDP, we talked about this, you know, a ton on our show. If we if we can't move uh, real estate uh, in, with 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 any significant numbers, if we can't do that, we're never going to get out of a recession. We're not a recession, a recovery from the inevitable recession that we're going into does not happen without housing being corrected. And as I said before, Sean, we are, oh my God, mommy dearest type of shape, the show shameless dysfunctional right now in housing and real estate. It's unbelievable how out of balance this market is. It's so out of balance that we're not even getting, we're not even getting solutions bantered about that could remotely start to fix what some of the problems are. I said this before to Dave Stevens, who is the past president of the FHA and who is the president of the Mortgage Bankers Association. And, you know, I'm a dollard. You know, he was appointed by President Obama to run the FHA. I'm a I'm a I'm a numbskull. And I said to him, I said, why don't we just go ahead and hire the Army Corps of Engineers to build small, smart houses? Because here's the thing. They can build a bridge over a 10 mile long swamp in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Surely they could build an 1100 square foot smart house, couldn't they? And he goes, you know what? I actually thought of the same thing. And what is interesting about that is that would be a solution, but it's one that I think our politicians are fearful of actually even talking about because you sound like a lunatic. But I mean, if we could talk about UFOs right now. <laughs> I mean, can't we talk about like the <laughs> Army Corps of Engineers building houses? Yeah. No, yeah. we can't do that, you see, because we have to we 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 have to stay preoccupied with who Taylor Swift is dating. We need yeah, that... that preoccupation right now. We have to be preoccupied with YouTube playing concerts in that big old lie out in Las Vegas right now. We have to be preoccupied with these things, you see. We can't talk about the real issues. Yeah, I was gonna say all I all I see uh, on some of these feeds is Taylor Swift showing up to a football game and a UFO being sighted over somewhere else. I'm ready for the invasion. Come on, yeah. alien invasion. I'm ready. <laughs> I was talking to a friend and uh, we were going back and forth on, on some different topics. And I was like, you know, it just, it's a really, really weird time to be alive right now, as far as what we see and what we, what we get to tolerate. All right. Getting back on it. Last topic for the day, which is crazy with all of the, the things that would, would bring friction to a market, which we, which we've seen, August posted a, a betterment of 5.8% compared to the August of last year. So we actually sold a bunch of homes in August. I'm wondering whenever this market finally does soften and, you know, cause the thought is, is people 
you know, I don't want to sell the house because I'm, I'm I'm gonna get smoked on the new house that I'm buying, but I'm gonna really you know make a million bucks on the house that I'm selling, what whatever. But whenever this thing kind of normalizes and softens a little bit, who's gonna be the big winners in a softer market when everything gets to a little bit easier during uh you know during the buying and selling process? I mean, everybody, right? I mean, mm -hmm. really, I mean, everybody, everybody benefits. Real estate, it, it's an engine. It needs to it needs to move. We need to move properties. Uh, everybody does. I mean, I, I forget what some of the numbers are, but when you think of when a house sells, how many people does that employ? How much money does that bring into a local local economy? How many Midwest uh, uh, cities? You're in Missouri, right? Mm -hmm. How many small towns out there would benefit from an influx of a couple million bucks a month into their economy? I mean, you know, I mean, it's 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 incalculable how many people would benefit from it. Um, now, I would I would say this, though for especially realtors and lenders right now, uh, we're, we're selling caution. And why would we sell caution? You're in the business of selling real estate. And, and that, that's what we do. And real estate is, you know, as a long-term investment has always always been good. And we saw that from 2008 when property values tanked. They're higher now than they were then. I, no one ever thought that was going to happen. But here's the deal. It's what you said a moment ago, Sean. Those entry-level homes, the small houses, uh, we're not building any of them. It's not even on the radar right now. So if you're somebody who bought what would now be deemed an entry-level home, which is expanded because we just don't build them anymore. Yeah. But if you have what is deemed a lower cost, lower priced entry-level home, that is going to be the hot ticket item for the foreseeable future. Okay. So right now, sure, we don't have enough inventory. However, if you sell your entry level home, you are going to get top dollar for it. Whatever you will get the the, the top of the market, whatever uh, whatever you can get that property property to appraise for, and probably then some. You will be buying into a softer market because presumably seventy five percent of the people out there are going to be moving up, not moving down. If that's the case for you, a hard market actually benefits the seller in an entry-level market, you're just buying into a softer market. Yes, I want to sell my property for top dollar where I'm not going to concede anything and I'm not going to pay anything and you're going to buy my house as is and you're going to like it or I'm going to sell it to one of the other 10 people who want to buy it. Then when I move up and when I go buy going forward, I'm going to start looking at some really interesting options that I got in front of me. I might, for example, I might ask that seller to pay five points uh, to buy my rate down. And then maybe, be, maybe because we do know rates are going to come back down, maybe I'm going to put that on a 5.1 or a 5.2 arm and then buy the rate down by 5%, which would get me a start rate in the threes. I could get a three right now for the next five years. That's on the table for me if I'm moving up. I might look at something like that. That seems like a pretty decent idea. So, I, you know, again, I like the idea of like, what can a real estate agent or what can a lender do right now to benefit their circumstance? Like that's a conversation I would start to have and have in droves. I would go out there to all the entry-level homes. I would identify who those people are and say, hey, listen, if you thought about selling right now, this is, a, don't be afraid to buy into a market. You're selling in a, you know, you hear this buy low, sell high. You've got the opportunity to do that with entry-level homes. This is how I'm going to occupy my time as a realtor or lender right now. And so the opportunity is always there for us. If the market softens, Sean, to get around to it, yeah, everybody will benefit because it will start to loosen things up. And as we've spoke about in droves and what you alluded to a few moments ago, I mean, I've had my baby boomers busting around me all over the place. You know, I, I just, I mean, I, I'm, I am making light of this, but I'm not making light of this, but I am the offspring from that generation who is now just falling right before our eyes. And this is something that I'm seeing almost on a daily basis, certainly a weekly basis with my sphere of influence and my ecosystem and their parents. And mm -hmm. when the largest generation who's ever owned property does start to pass away, that inventory is going to start to avail itself. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I just had a, from my, from what I do, how I occupy my time outside of the show has nothing to do with my show or my involvement in real estate, but just from what I do outside of work, I've referred two listings to two real estate agents in the last week because, for this exact reason, one of my friends has parents had a reverse mortgage. His mother just passed away this last last week. I referred that over, and then I have another friend of mine whose parents passed away, and, and he's going to sell the house and move to Spain. No, oh. and so you you know so again a lot there 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 this opportunity is is making itself available for those who are astute enough to find a way to get in the middle of these type of conversations on real estate. So as a yeah. lender or realtor in any market, we 
age doesn't know any boundaries, does it? So I would I would start to look I would start to look in those areas as a realtor or lender. Yeah, the industry, uh, you know, real estate agent or lender, um, we're very adaptive, and the ones that want to hustle can always find a way of being able to uh, be of of service and to uh, still navigate through. Because you know what we experienced in 08, every time Dick and Harry owned a broker shop, and you know there was lenders everywhere, and then whenever we went through all of that with licensing and everything, it kind of expunged a lot of people out of the business. And whenever things flipped everyone had much more you know, the market share just everyone started popping and um yeah. you know uh, it, it, we're coming up on renewal time again this year there was a huge drop off last year I, I i'm interested to see how many people don't renew their mortgage license this year and also their real estate license this year and uh you know onward and upward for the folks that that made it through let me ask you a question yeah so there's over 3 million licensed real estate agents out there. Now, we know that they don't all practice real estate. And we know that they're not all realtors, not realtors, but realtors. Uh -oh. Don't say the A. Don't say the A. Real uh, tours deal with it. Real tours. We know that. I don't know why you're so proud of that. NAR has been selling you guys down the river for a <laughs> decade now. <laughs> but, okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I mean this, too. So let's just chop it down. There's 2 million licensed real estate agents. That would include the realtors. If a million were to quit tomorrow, what would happen? A million? I mean, it's probably the millionaire doing a damn thing anyway. I don't know. <laughs> you want to know what happened? What? Service would improve. It would or would not? It would. Oh, 100%. Yes. You, okay. get the, you get the non-players out of it and you get the people that actually know what the hell they're doing that do it more than a one transaction a year. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so, if if 1.6 million realtors quit, what would happen? I would think Re that it would even improve it even further. Isn't that scary? But no, I'm not, we're not joking here. Well, you know what? What did, what did we say? It's the top 2% of real estate agents do 75% of all yeah, business. It's the the numbers are, rule. Are, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. We we not only would it be a good thing, and that and that by the way, that's a sad commentary on an industry mm -hmm. because for the great real estate agents out there, and I know a ton of them, like uh, the one of the real estate agents who I just referred over to my friend whose parents just passed away, he's calling me for advice on a daily basis. He's got a whole bunch of stuff to untie, as yeah. far as trusts, as far as accounts, as far as crap in the house, as far as that reverse mortgage. This is going to be a full-time job for somebody for the next four months. And he's he's leaning on me right now. I don't have the bandwidth to do it. I got a great real estate agent who's going to work with him and yeah. figure all of this stuff out. She'll, it's going to be months before she lists this place. She's going to get paid handsomely. The house is going to sell for close to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be a six-month job, six job for her. So there's great realtors out there. But for those great real estate agents like the one I was just speaking of, um, it's the other 1.6 million real estate agents out there are, are, are really soiling your reputation by not doing a great job, by not knowing how to fill out a contract, by not knowing how to negotiate a transaction, by being too eager to list a property, too eager to sell a property and not putting your client's needs first, even though I know you're held to a higher standard of ethics because you took a Scantron test. I get that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just saying a sociopath. Ted yeah. Bundy could have passed that Scantron test. He could have passed it. He would have figured it out. But that doesn't mean he's got the higher standard of ethics. No, it doesn't. But what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, it would, we, the, the industry will benefit from what's taking place right now. Sure. You know, with these renewals coming up, Sean, the only thing that I could hope for, and this is because I love real estate and I live real estate, and it matters to me reputationally how we come across. Let's have the forest fire for a little while. I think we kind of need it. It's going to hurt, but darn it, there's going to be a lot of great growth and offspring and opportunity that comes out of this. Yeah, and I think we're knee deep in the forest fire. <laughs> and it's been, it, 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 the dumpster's been on fire for about a year and 10 months now. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for uh, some reprieve. Uh, but anyways, I appreciate you, sir. We're at our time. Like always, have a wonderful uh Wonderful week. Enjoy. And uh, we'll be talking to you again next month. You too. Bye. Happy selling, people. Happy Jeff. selling. <laughs> Smile. <laughs>